This episode of the Beer Guys Radio Show is brought to you by Crim and Associates, currently seeking a brewery tenant for their development in Dunwoody, Georgia. If you're considering opening a brewery in the Atlanta area, call Todd Simrow at 404-226-6526 for more information. We're joined this week by Bart Watson, Chief Economist at the Brewers Association, to talk about the state of the craft beer industry. With the explosive growth we've seen in the industry, many people are discussing the possibility of a craft beer bubble. We talk with Bart about the existence of the bubble and where there's still room for growth. He also shares some stats with us on the Great American Beer Festival, the attendees, the popular categories in the competition, and the medal winners. We discuss the excise tax cuts as well as the aluminum tariffs and how those are impacting breweries. We also take a look at brewer and consumer thoughts on the independent craft beer sale. Our industry is booming, but will that continue? Keep listening to see what the numbers tell us. We hope you enjoy. Open up a tab, grab a seat, and pour a pint. It's time for the Beer Guys Radio Show. You want free beer? Go to the brewery. Dedicated to the art, science, and enjoyment of craft beer. Yo, what's wrong with the beer we got? Now, here are your hosts, Tim Dennis and Brian Hewitt. And welcome to the Beer Guys Radio Show. We are radio for the local craft beer movement. We're broadcasting from the Beer Guys Radio Studios at Ironmonger Brewing in Marietta, Georgia. I'm Tim Dennis. And I'm Brian Hewitt. This week we're talking about the state of craft beer and the industry with Bart Watson. Bart is the chief economist at the Brewers Association where he pours over numbers all day long to see what's going on in the craft beer world. He enjoys sports, good food, and good beer. Ladies, he's not available. And Bart, we have here that you once were a world-class ultimate Frisbee player. Is that right? Yeah, ultimate Frisbee was a big part of my pre-beer life. Uh, Definitely something that I spent way too much time doing in grad school and dragged the dissertation out a little bit. Was it all (laughs) for entertainment or did you ever get sponsorships and, and play pro ultimate Frisbee? Uh, there's not much of pro ultimate frisbee. There actually are a few of pro leagues now, but but you're not really making a living on it. But uh, I did get paid to to go around the world a few times, so it, it's opened up some okay, opportunities see? for me. That's something. That's I know friends that have done other little sporty things. I can't think exactly what they were off the top of my head, but I know that they would mention getting sponsorships. I had a friend that was a, a casual uh, bicyclist. I guess pretty serious bicyclist, but he got sponsored by Nike and some bike companies. Then he got to take trips and that, and he's like, you know, I didn't make a big living off of but I got to do some really cool stuff. Casually so. professional. Maybe I worded that wrong. <laughs> Ca- he was a casual professional, I, as opposed to a professional professional. Very cavalier right? about the whole thing. Yes, yes. absolutely. So, so Bart, uh, GABF just uh, completed out there in Denver. How did uh, things go there? Things went great. It was the biggest GABF of all time, 62,000 people over the three days. Um, it's, it's always amazing to see it all, to see it you know, unfold, see the new quirks of the festival, see the new breweries who haven't been there. But uh, it was another great year. It's, it's truly the biggest and best beer festival in the world. That's, I don't think if I – th- I think everyone – or not only 50% of us here tonight have been to it, but it's really something that if you don't get to go every year, you, you really have to do GABF at least once if you're a craft beer fan. It's a, it's a, an American beer fan's mecca, I think. you got to make the pilgrimage at least once, Brian. I know. I keep hearing this. Well, you have to go eventually. Yes. One day I will go, Tim. One yeah. We, we really enjoyed watching the awards and some of the surprises there and that, but uh, always a good time getting everything together on that. So, Brian, a busy week for us. Sure. As always there. Uh, we had something fun last weekend that we got to do that we pitched here. We did a sneak peek preview of our collaboration beer with Reformation Brewing Struzu, which is a Berliner Weiss with uh, strawberry and yuzu fruit. It was received very well by those that got to try it. We had a lot of fun up there checking it out. We're going to have a can release soon, so that was a lot of fun. Uh, we got to do some Oktoberfest, and Brian, something yes. we always look forward to each year here at Five Seasons Brew Pub uh, in Atlanta. They do a very nice Oktoberfest dinner and uh, beer thing. I'm going to go out on a limb and say it's my favorite Oktoberfest thing I do every year. I th- you know, I think I'd have to agree with you. Yeah. I definitely have to agree with you, but I also enjoy, you know, Der Beer Garten sure. going there, some good beer. There's, They do a lot of nice Oktoberfest. Oktoberfest stuff in Atlanta. So they, we yes, get to they have really a good do. time. Yeah. But the Schweinhoxen, if I pronounce that correctly, yeah, that's Hoxen. that's quite nice. Yes. But <laughs> good time there. Good time there, Brian. So uh what else did you get into this week? Well, I stopped over at the Monday night garage and ate some uh some waffles, some chicken and waffles, some 
pulled pork and waffles and drank some uh, beer cocktails to go with it. Beer mosas, I guess they, beer you mosas, call them. Sure. Uh, oddly, you know, chicken and waffles you think would be the easy winner. I they had a kind of a waffle pulled pork sandwich that I think was was my favorite of the uh, mine too. The thing. Yeah. And uh, we we swung by and hit a kombucha joint that's close by to Monday Night Garage, right there in the uh, the Lee and White area, just down the stretch. Big development bit. here in Atlanta. Yeah, a lot of very a lot yeah. of beverage, food, and drink stuff coming around over there. Some really good stuff there. There is, yeah. Yes. That, that kombucha was I I liked it more than I expected to, and I even tried some interesting, some unusual. Some vegan cheese. Vegan cheese, yeah. yes. <laughs> I like that stuff, and I did yeah. not expect to. I have not tried very many vegan products that are ripoffs of non-vegan things yeah. <laughs> where they get even cl- – and, you know, the vegans will sit, try and sell you on it. Like they'll have something that tastes like a bag of grass with walnuts, and they'll be like, yeah. that tastes just like beef. Yeah. And you're like, no, it doesn't. Have you ever had beef? How long yeah. have you been vegan? Because this is not beef. You've been vegan a long time, right? haven't That's you? Just, yeah. It's just like beef, Brian. But this was – it was cheesy. I mean, there was a cheesiness yeah. to it. So, uh, you know, I don't have any problems with eating actual cheese, either uh, medically or ethically, but I still wouldn't be upset if someone put that on the cheese board. I was intrigued by it because I'm always looking for a way to cut out some lactose in right. my diet because I play fast and loose with a lactose intolerance situation. So it was acceptable. It yeah. was acceptable. Okay. There's some additional fibrous structure going on with it that's not in your typical cheese, but I'll allow it. I'll allow it. Acceptable. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And one more thing that uh, that we did this week, Brian, we met with a group of very passionate and dedicated homebrewers. There are some problems with Georgia's homebrewing laws. Things keep getting better little by little, but things still need to change. So we got together with Nancy Palmer, executive director of our Craft Brewers Guild, one of our state representatives, Brett Harrell. And we all discussed kind of where we stand now and where we need to go, just get a good foundation to move forward from there and hopefully make some positive changes in Georgia's homebrewing law. Sure. So. Sure. Yeah. Well, you know, Tim, I think it might be time for Truck and Taps Beers of the Week. Crack open a cold one. It's the Truck and Tap Beer of the Week. Woo-hoo! Craft beer and food trucks in downtown Woodstock. Truckandtap.com. Well, Brian, we've got a great selection. That we've already got into a couple of them. So and something we're doing a little different since our guest is not a brewer this week. We've just got a hodgepodge. We've just gone all yes. over the place with what we've got. So we've got one that Smalls brought us from one of her travels, a Jackie O's. Oh, my gosh. What's that word? I Col- think it's Chomo Lungma. Chomo Lungma? Como Lungma? Yeah, it has something to do with, a, uh, a, I think, the brewer's brother ascending yeah. to the summit of Mount Everest. Okay. And it was kind of celebrating that. It's a brown ale. But it's a tasty brown ale it is nice. that we're enjoying. Yeah, really we have nice. a little Dragon's Milk Reserve that Brian brought in that is a banana coconut. And, uh, Brian, you got an interesting flavor note in this, right? Yeah, so that tastes like bananas, also the uh, buttered popcorn jelly beans, jelly bellies. So okay. those two together, so there's a little bit of a fakeness to it. I'm not saying I hate it. It just it's strikes me as unusual yeah when you get yeah. a jelly bean note in your beer that always throws you off and then we've got uh, we've actually got some here from our good friends at iron Marger. they have tweaked several of their recipes they have a new brewmaster here so we got into their annual and steam breather some of their ipas damascus that they have tweaked and uh, uh they're good improved juicier yeah yeah uh, that's nice west coast style northeast so some good stuff there definitely so brian what's happening this week in the news What's in the news? The beer guys have the scoop. Extra, extra, read all about it. Time for headlines. All right, so Brewbound's got the hot news this week. They were talking all about Craft Brew Alliance and their full acquisition of three of their partner craft breweries. Those breweries are Massachusetts Cisco Brewers, North Carolina's Appalachian Mountain Brewery, and Miami's Winwood Brewing. So the total cost of the three separate purchases, and they are actually separate purchases, but announced at the same time, uh, we don't know. But we do know that $23 million went to acquire Cisco alone, and the total of them will be less than $45 million. These breweries will account for 5% of CBA's total production volume for 2018, and uh, as I said, these were already partner brewers with CBA, so CBA already had a stake, I believe, in all three of them ahead of time. Originally, the plan was not to acquire the breweries, but the, quote, lack of complete integration was holding the partners back. 
So it's interesting to note that Anheuser-Busch owns 31.4% of the Craft Brew Alliance. So at this point, it's safe to say that uh, Craft Brew Alliance no longer is considered actual craft beer by the Brewers Association definition. But the ownership hierarchy makes it all a little confusing. Uh, Collectively, the CBA produces 8.5 million barrels per year, and that's 2.5 million over the craft cutoff. So by both standards, they're uh, outside of craft at this point. So I don't think that uh, they, they count. No longer count. You know, that's interesting that these uh, kind of collectives that are coming up with these craft, they're like, we're not big beer. And I know there's a few of them out there and they sell it, you know, about, hey, these guys still get to be independent in that. But wondering how big they have to get before they just become big beer, you know, right along with it. Yeah, so. I'm really not sure about that. Yeah. It's so. it's it's kind of interesting until they bought out the, the entirety of the, the breweries. Those partner breweries might have still been considered craft because it was in the 20% range. But now that they're fully owned, there's just no way. Okay. Well, you're listening to the Beer Guys Radio Show. We do need to take a break, but we'll be back very soon to talk with Bart Watson about beer stats. We are Reformation Brewery, celebrating the reformer in you. Locally crafted within the renowned Etowah watershed of Woodstock, Georgia, Reformation creates yeast-forward brews full of aroma and flavor crafted to last. Come see us in beautiful Woodstock, Georgia, for a tour and tasting of unique brews that you can't find anywhere else. Reformation Brewery. Set beer free. ReformationBrewery.com. Craft beer forged with a reverence for tradition and new styles that start a revolution. Ironmonger Brewing. The brewers at Ironmonger Brewing pride themselves at being masters of barrel-aged, hoppy, and sour beers. They invite you to their tap room in Marietta, Georgia to taste and see. Also visit their barrel room for an intimate drinking experience with great live entertainment. Keep up to date on all things Ironmonger by liking them on Facebook. Ironmonger Brewing. Establishing a new standard in craft beer. guys on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Well, I'm sure I'd feel much worse if I weren't under such heavy sedation. Now, back to the Beer Guys Radio Show. Welcome back to the Beer Guys Radio Show. Remember to subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts and make sure to leave us a review. We're broadcasting from the Beer Guys Radio Studios at Ironmonger Brewing, and we're talking the state of the craft beer industry with Bart Watson from the Brewers Association. Bart, thanks again. We do appreciate you joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. And Bart, you are the chief economist for the Brewers Association. You get to play with all the numbers about what's going on in the world of beer, correct? That, that's correct. I, I count ones and zeros all day, but my, my ones are breweries, and that's a lot of fun. Okay, good deal. Well, <laughs> one thing we want to, we talked about a little bit on break. So, uh, Brian, I think it was a, you, a printing error in your source, but sure. the numbers on the Craft Brew Alliance, we were off by, what, 7.6 million? Something I like think. that, so, yeah. I had so, a decimal place moved to the right. wrong spot. So rather than 8.5 million, Bart, you said that they're actually 850,000 barrel production. Is that correct? I think that's about right. Once you add in these new breweries, we had them between oh, seven and 800,000 last year. So, And that's the, the Craft Brew Alliance that we're talking about, right. of course, from the previous story. Correct, yeah. yes. And a question on, on, on those, Bart, since we're kind of talking about that a little bit, we've seen a lot of these collectives coming in. And uh, like the Craft Brew Alliance, we have uh, uh, other groups, you know, Fireman's Capital is another one. Uh, I know that they are pitching about independence, and it's a way to kind of expand and take advantage of being part of a bigger company by retaining your independence. But as far as the Brewers Association and their consideration as a craft brewery, uh, do these types of collectives allow them to remain craft brewers? Uh, They do under our current definition. And the Brewers Association definition draws a a difference between, you know, people who have that capital backing um, and those who have the backing of a large brewer and get all those additional advantages, the access to distribution, the access to raw materials, you know, not just purchasing with the scale of a few craft brewers added together, but, you know, purchasing with the scale of one of the world's largest brewing companies. So um, until they're more than 25% owned by a large brewer, uh, we would consider any of those collectives still part of the craft brewer data set. 
Yeah. You know, I was just looking at your article. It was one of the ones that I was considering for the show here. And you have just done the uh, the medal winning analysis for the GABF. I was wondering, uh, you know, what, what you could tell us about, like, trends that you saw in, in the, the medals awarded. Oh, uh, yeah, that's a great question. And, um, you know, the that's always a fun one. It's always fun to, to get to write something a little bit lighter than, you know, openings and closings or, or production growth. Um, you know, I think the biggest trend that we've seen over the years is just increased participation from all parts of the country. Um, you know, certainly we see the number of entries go up or down as the number of breweries goes up or down in a particular place. But um, it's really awesome to see that that it truly is an American competition. Um, and it's not just, you know, brewers from Colorado or the West Coast, but you know, a lot of the entries are coming from the Midwest and the Southeast as well. Um, you know, this year, the West Coast had a good year in terms of winning medals, but there were states further afield that also did well. South Carolina had its best year ever winning seven medals. So uh, lots of interesting things, lots of new winners. Um, and, you know, as the competition grows every year, it gets harder and harder to win. So one of the categories that we know was the most popular, and it always is the IPAs and the, the new hazy and juicy IPA category. So outside of those that have been getting the most news, what are some other popular categories this year? Um, well, you know, many of the barrel-aged ones are still pretty popular, um, you know, kind of the, the big barrel-aged imperial stouts. Um, you know, we continue to see, you know, popularity around a lot of the hoppy styles, so not just the, the headline ones, but, you know, pale ale is always very popular. Um, you know, increasingly, it used to be you could say, here are the unpopular ones and here are the popular ones. And now with, you know, more than 8,000 entries, it's here are the popular ones and here are the really popular ones. Um, you know, there aren't a lot of categories <laughs> where there aren't 100 entries. So, um, but it, 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 it's amazing and, and it's awesome. If you've never been in that room and watched the brewers, you know, accept their medals, it's, it's a lot of fun. And, um, you know, every style is celebrated there and, and somebody's excited to win every medal. So I'm curious, uh, you broke it down by regions, didn't you? What, which regions uh, participated the most in the competition and which did the least? Well, we see generally that, that some of the regions a little closer to Colorado do participate a little bit more. Uh, so the Mountain West, uh, you know, out punches its weight a little bit, um, as does the West Coast. Um, but, you know, mostly what we find is that it's people are participating in line with the number of breweries in a place. So, um, you know, we see the most breweries in the country are in the Great Lakes region. Um, and, and I used federal regions. You could break this up a whole bunch of different ways. Um, and so they're entering um, at a higher rate than most other regions. The most entries came from the southwest, which includes California, which, you know, is approaching a thousand breweries. So it's not surprising they would have a lot of entries. Um, and then we saw some fewer entries from from the northeast, New England. Um, one I was a little surprised by was the Southeast, that the Southeast region sends a lot of beers to GABF um, and, and now has about 12 percent of the breweries in the country. So, um, you know, it certainly participated at a rate that was uh, commensurate with that. Now, Bart, something I was really looking forward to talking to you about this week, actually the one main topic, we've got a lot to discuss, but this was one that I really wanted to discuss with you, the craft beer bubble. So uh, does the craft beer bubble exist? You know, it. I don't think it does. Um, and, and it's funny you ask this because I think this was the first question I got asked when I got this job five years ago when there were right. 2,000 breweries in the country. And, you know, I, I said no. And, and I'm glad I was right and that, you know, there was, there was room for 5,000 more in counting breweries. Um, and. You know, I, I think what people miss is that there's just been a there's been a fundamental demand shift out there. And, you know, we may not see every brewery that's out there succeed now, um, but that's that's part of it, a mature market. That's market competition. You know, nobody asks when a bar or restaurant closes if there's a restaurant bubble and we're just going to lose every restaurant that we have in the U.S. Or, um, you know, when that you know new business down the street that, you know, does something crazy, the arcade bar closes. Nobody asks about an arcade bar bubble. Um, so I think people are just still a little bit uncertain, unconfident about this great new world of beer that we've reached and and that's one reason they asked that but to me it's built on consumer demand it's not going anywhere um and we're still seeing growth in the market yeah you know that's something you mentioned about places closing and people are like oh there's the bubble you know yeah when when it's nothing but openings and to be honest in a boom period you can ride any business can ride a little while uh when you open up you know sure. you, you it takes you a little while to run through you know, your capital there. But, uh, you know, you, we're starting to see some of those that got in to the boom. Uh, we've had a few in Georgia here. Uh, I saw news today that a, a brewery in Columbus, Ohio, announced, hey, until further notice, we're closed. And uh, when I shared that with my friend in Columbus, he said, oh, there it is. You know, there's that, you know, things are starting to collapse on yeah, that. The but, bubble's bursting. But that's when we're in a period like this and, and we're in, we are a few years in, you know, three to five years into a, a pretty good boom period. 
we're going to see some closures, right, Bart? I think that's completely correct. And that, you know, as we get more breweries and, you know, even if a low percentage of them close, we're going to get more closures. That's just how it works. And, um, you know, what I tell people when, when I talk about this to brewers is that the last 10 years were the unusual ones, a period where the industry grew double digits, where no one closed, where we had a tremendous number of openings. That's unusual. When you look at any other market, they would kill for that. Um, and the one that we're into now where there's slower growth, where closings and openings are coming back closer together, uh, that's more normal what you see out in markets. So the uh, last week I was doing a news story about Lagunitas laying off about 12% of their staff. And he compared, the CEO compared that to the, uh, the late 90s, saying the industry was in the same place as the late 90s. Do you think that's where we're at right now or is it a, just a completely different situation here? I think it's a completely different situation. Um, you know, there may be some lessons you can learn about, you know, tightening your belts and, you know, getting more efficient and, and finding ways to grow in a tough market. But, you know, in the late 90s, most of the country still didn't know what, what craft beer was. They didn't have a local brewer. They weren't connected to these brands. Um, and, and we didn't have that same acceptance with distributors and retailers that we have now. So I, I think we're in fundamentally a different market now. Um, you know, we have thousands more breweries. The market share is, is much, much higher. Um, so while I accept that it's, we're going into a period that's going to be competitive, that there are going to be more closures, um, I think there's a lot more reason for optimism now than, than there was in the late 90s, early 2000s. So you'd say there's like a better integration of craft beer now versus the uh, the 90s. It's, it's part of the community now, whereas before it was just the uh, kind of a, a special new fun sparkly toy, perhaps. Exactly. And in the late 90s, early 2000s, I mean, one of the things that caused the challenges for the craft brewing industry was that there were a lot of brewers getting in who were trying to make a quick buck who, you know, maybe weren't making the best beer. And often because the market was still so small, that was the first beer that a beer lover had from a small and independent brewer. Um, today, you know, if they have a, you know, a beer that's maybe a little bit less than they expect quality wise, somebody says, well, I can go back to one of my local brewers that I know is great. I can go back to, you know, a Sierra Nevada. There's lots of great beer out there that people have tried. And, and so, you know, one bad experience isn't going to have them, you know, running into wine and spirits. Bart, we have plenty more to talk to you about, but we do need to take a quick break. You're listening to the Beer Guys Radio Show, and we'll be back with more beer stats right after this. Looking for a great way to promote your business? Cedar Stream has what you need. For apparel, stickers, signs, and banners, we're your one-stop shop. There are never any art fees or setup fees. And if you need your items quickly, there's no additional charge for rush orders. Whether you own a brewery, bar, bottle shop, or other business, Cedar Stream is ready to serve you. Visit cedarstream.com for more info or call 800-686-7488 for immediate assistance. Cedar Stream, we print America. Are you thinking about opening a brewery in the Atlanta area? If so, take a look at the park at Georgetown. This unique community will feature a collection of restaurants as well as a craft brewery within the new JW Homes luxury development, Dunwoody Green. Conveniently located less than half a mile from I-285, this enclave of restaurants will be the gathering place in Dunwoody. Krim and Associates, the developer of the park at Georgetown, wants to talk to you. For more information, call Todd Semrau at 404-226-6526. on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Cannibal! Cannibal coming. Now, back to the Beer Guys Radio Show. Welcome back to the Beer Guys Radio Show. I want to give a quick shout out to one of our great radio affiliates, WRKQ, 1250 AM in Madisonville, Tennessee. Catch Beer Guys Radio on WRKQ every Saturday at noon Eastern. We're broadcasting from the Beer Guys Radio Studios at Ironmonger Brewing, and we're talking with Bart Watson, Chief Economist at the Brewers Association. Bart, we would like to talk to you about brewery numbers and uh, the growth that we're seeing here. So I I think we're headed towards, if I heard correctly, uh, 7,000 we're coming up on. Is that correct? That is correct. I think it's pretty highly likely we're going to hit 7,000 before the end of the year here. That's something. That's And uh, looking at growth rates, what, was, what did 27 finish the year at? 
uh, 20, uh, 2017, you know, we're, we're going to get, you know, revise that number up, um, when we, when we do our 2018 numbers, but you know, probably more like 6,400 operating all our parts. So when you take out the closings and you're looking more like 6,200 and, um, you know, I, I think it's possible we're going to see a thousand openings this year in the U S, um, with a couple hundred closings. So that's going to put us, you know, a little bit above, a little bit above 7,000. I think yeah. I read a uh, r- report about that saying that there were actually 9,000 open permits or something crazy like that. Is is that right? That's right. We're getting close to 10,000, um, the latest quarterly number. I think it was up to about 9,800. Um, and, you know, it really shows no signs of slowing. We're still seeing lots of interest in opening breweries. Um, you know, one of the things I, I like to remind people of is that the number of breweries is probably not the most important thing you should be looking at if you're thinking about the beer market, uh, because the smallest 75% of the breweries in the country make about half a percent of the beer. So you add up okay. the smallest 75% right. of breweries, and they're one out of 200 beers that are made in the U.S. So is there room to grow? You know, not everywhere, but but there are a lot of places. Well, that's uh, I think we talked briefly in the past, uh, Bart, about Georgia being a growth market because we were so behind the times with modernizing our laws. So you still have those areas that do have pockets where they can grow like Georgia. You know, we've seen big growth over the last few years, and I'm sure there's some other states playing catch up as well to all of that. So Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah, totally true. You know, I mean, if Georgia had as many licenses as, you know, a, a state like Vermont and, you know, Vermont's an outlier. So I, I'm cherry picking my examples a little bit, but, you know, it, it would have 10 to 15 times as many breweries. And, um, you know, even within states, too, it's worth remembering that there's different places that are going to be able to support different things. I mean, Atlanta is basically a different state from parts of, of Georgia. So, um, you know, is, is, is Georgia ever going to catch up to Oregon or Colorado? Maybe not. But um, can it take more breweries? Almost certainly, yes. When looking at the numbers, like talking about the 9,000 or 10,000 that are in process open permits and that does the Brewers Association look at like completion percentage of how many of these do you think we will actually see open say in the next couple of years it's a great question and it's actually a hard one to answer Um, we used to see that there was about a two-year lag so that permit number was actually a really good predictor of how many breweries we would get about two years later so if you go back and you look at the permit numbers from two years ago um, it's right about the brewery number that we are now however uh, at the beginning of 2017 uh, the TTB changed its rules, uh, partly uh, due to some things that we were pushing at the federal level. Um, and so small brewers no longer have to put up that $50,000 bond they used to have to put up to get a brewer's permit. Um, and so I do have a suspicion that we're seeing more brewers kick the tires, uh, or potential brewers, I should say, of opening a brewery, because you know now it's it's free. You can do it. You can you go through that process. Obviously, you have to do some steps to convince the TTB that you're going to be a real brewery. But um, I think we may see a lower completion percentage in the next couple of years than we have in the past. That's an interesting thing yeah you lower the barriers to entry and then you know you're going to have a lot more entries basically sure. and, yeah. and on the flip side of that brian we talked about that in the past with georgia and the number of breweries that we had we had a small number of breweries but for the most part our breweries were quality breweries yeah because the barrier to entry was pretty high so someone who just wanted to kick the tires on opening the brewery or brew pub didn't do it because there was a pretty good investment to make that happen so Indeed. See both sides of that, definitely. Well, I know one thing that's big to our brewers right now, Bart, is the uh, changes in excise tax that started at the beginning of this year. So it was December of last year. Congress passed the legislation that included the two-year provision, what they called uh, the Craft Beverage Modernization and Tax Reform Act. And I believe this extended to beer, wine, and spirits. Of course, we like to hear it about the beer world. But one of the big things that came out of that was lower excise tax for brewers. So can you tell us more about that? Sure. And that's something that the Brewers Association, we've been working on for years. Um, you know, small brewers pay every tax that any business would pay. And in addition, they pay a you know both federal and state excise tax. So since we work at the federal level, we worked on the federal excise tax. And uh, for most brewers, their rates are now half of what they were in 2017. So they went down from $7 a barrel to three fifty a barrel. Uh, once you get a little bit bigger and you get above 60,000 barrels, then they've gone down less from $18 a barrel to, to $16 a barrel. But, you know, we think that that's real money that's going back into the pockets of brewers and hopefully is allowing them to reinvest in their business, hire more people, or, you know, simply offset the rising costs that a lot of breweries are, are seeing. And, you know, without that money, we might see that closing number be even higher. So it, 
I'm glad you said reinvesting those funds. Do you have any uh, insight into what is happening with those cost savings to the breweries? Do you know, do you have any data on what the breweries are doing with what they save on those excise taxes? We do. And that's certainly a big part of what we're, we're using right now to you know go back and, and talk to lawmakers and show them what breweries in their district are doing. Uh, the number one thing they're doing is, you know, capital expenditures that they're, you know, using it to buy more tanks and make more beer to, you know, upgrade equipment. Um, but, you know, taking that money and when you're making, you know, it's only a couple bucks per barrel, but, you know, that adds up for, for you know, breweries sure. that grow in size. And, um, you know, that allows them then to, you know, make that purchase, make, you know, buy a filtration system, you know, buy a centrifuge, you know, do something um, to upgrade their brewery. Um, and, and also to hire people, you know, we've seen certainly brewers say that's the money I'm going to put into, you know, building out my tasting room and, and then hiring, you know, some people to staff that. So, um, they're all over the board, but, but the number one thing is, is capital investments back into the business. Now I know with these things, it's a two year provision and it's easy when you're in the middle of the provision to forget about the fact that it's going to expire at a certain point. So mm -hmm. what is expected? Uh, what's the expected outcome when this does expire? And it, are you trying to kind of prepare breweries for that? Yeah, well, we're hoping it won't expire. Uh, we're, we're certainly telling the stories of how brewers have used this money. Uh, we're also letting lawmakers know that, you know, if this goes back to the rates that we saw before, uh, that's effectively a tax raise for the 2,000 breweries that will have opened under this new, you know, uh, recalibration uh, that will have never had those higher rates. So that they're raising taxes on on 2,000 breweries. Um, you know, we'll certainly keep our members informed about we th what we see as the likelihood of passage. And you know, passing anything in Washington, particularly tax related, is not particularly easy at the moment. Um, but but we're confident that you know, small brewers are powerful economic engines in their community and that we can tell that story and, and get that uh, recalibration extended. Uh, another thing I see a lot in the news, and it's it's mentioned like in tons and tons of different articles I've read about uh, beer related news, basically aluminum tariffs are starting to cause higher prices for the consumer. Do you have any data on how big of an impact this really is having on the industry as a whole? It's certainly having an impact. And it's one of the things, unfortunately, that's offsetting some of those tax savings that we saw uh, from the excise tax recalibration. So we're here for members, uh, aluminum prices, can prices going up six to ten percent. Um, you know, it'll vary based on you know where they're buying from, what scale they're buying at. Uh, but certainly, that's you know a, a significant cost. Uh, you know, particularly when other th costs are going up as well. Um, it's also leading to some availability issues because you know other producers are buying up as much aluminum as they can before prices go up. Um, so if you're a small brewer and you're at the bottom of the feeding chain, um, it may mean that you know particularly for certain can sizes, uh, cans are hard to get at the moment. We saw a post from someone uh, on an online beer forum recently that said that it had impacted a cost of $3 per 24-pack on beer, and that was blamed on the tariffs. Does that sound like a realistic price adjustment just based on the aluminum tariffs? You know, it could be as it ripples through the system. And, you know, it's worth remembering for, for the consumer. I mean, it's they're not just going to see the tariff, uh, you know, and its effect on the brewer, but they're going to see it as it ripples through the distributor and then it ripples through the retailer. Um, so that's probably a little bit larger than it would be for, you know, the brewer per se. But, um, you know, you see those costs get reflected and magnified as they move through the system. Um, and, you know, certain brewers are going to have to eat that cost, too. I mean, certain brewers aren't going to be raising their prices because they don't have the market positioning, um, and they're just going to have to accept lower profits and and you know maybe just not be able to to keep going on. And and I don't want to be you know hyperbolic and say that the aluminum tariffs are going to put people out of business. Um, but amongst other cost raises, energy prices going up, hop prices going up, barley prices going up, um, it's certainly posing a challenge for a lot of breweries. Fascinating to look at all of this and see how it all pans out. Uh, we do need to take a break. We're going to talk to Bart more right after this about the challenges facing new brewers, and we're going to talk some about the independent craft brewers. So you listen to Beer Guys Radio Show. We'll be back right after this. Craft beer forged with a reverence for tradition and new styles that start a revolution. Ironmonger Brewing. The brewers at Ironmonger Brewing pride themselves at being masters of barrel-aged, hoppy, and sour beers. They invite you to their tap room in Marietta, Georgia to taste and see. Also visit their barrel room for an intimate drinking experience with great live entertainment. Keep up to date on all things Ironmonger by liking them on Facebook. Ironmonger Brewing. Establishing a new standard in craft beer. 
It's Brian and Tim, the beer guys. If you're like us, no lunch or dinner is complete without a pint or two of craft beer. Which is why Truck and Tap in downtown Woodstock and Alpharetta are always on our list. Tim, why do they call it Truck and Tap? Well, the tap part is easy, Brian. They've got 18 of them. As for the truck part, that's where it gets interesting. Truck and Tap features your favorite Atlanta area food trucks daily, so that way you're getting a different menu every day. Truck and Tap in downtown Woodstock, Alpharetta, and coming soon to Duluth in 2018. Truckandtap.com. Let them know that the beer guys sent you. guys on facebook twitter and instagram now back to the beer guys radio show oh god here we go again dork alert welcome back to the beer guys radio show if you enjoy the show please consider supporting us on patreon go to patreon.com slash beer guys patrons get early show access beer guys swag and some other cool perks we're broadcasting from the beer guys radio studios at ironmonger brewing and we're talking craft beer stats with bart watson from the brewers association bart we talked uh, tariffs and taxes and all of that good stuff before the break there and uh, we have a few more topics we'd like to cover with you here and uh one we'd like to talk to you some kind of about the challenges as we've been talking about this changing market here seven thousand breweries potentially nine to ten thousand over the next couple of years. As new breweries open there, what are you seeing as some of the biggest challenges for new brewers entering the market? Sure. I think the first and biggest challenge is just standing out um, with, you know, 7,000 breweries and counting. There's a lot of great beers out there. And so, you know, finding a place in the market where you can have your own unique place, your unique voice, you know, making beers that, um, you know, are, are worthy of, of purchasing on a, from a crowded shelf, that's one major challenge that every brewery should be thinking about. Um, I think another is, is access to distribution. Um, this will vary place to place, whether you can self-distribute, you know, what are the options, but, um, you know, shelves are crowded, tap handles are crowded. Um, it's hard to get out in the marketplace. And so, you know, making great beer isn't enough. You have to have a great plan. You have to have a great sure. team. And, um, you know, so there's lots of breweries that, you know, probably five or 10 years ago would be growing gangbusters. Um, and now, you know, are struggling just to, to stay afloat. So, um, you know, these, these are all the challenges you'd expect to see in a mature market. And, um, you know, brewers that, that can figure them out, I think, still have opportunities. But it's, it's not as easy as it was a few years ago. So I keep seeing this mentioned over and over again. And uh, from the, the same sources, basically, I got to ask, are wine and spirits really the enemy of craft beer or are they only really the enemy of big beer? Uh, you know, I, I think they're certainly part of the conversation for craft brewers. Um, I wouldn't say they're the enemy. They're something that brewers should keep in mind. Um, you know, the, the number one reason people say they drink less craft is that they're drinking more of other things. Um, so certainly, you know, brewers need to think about um, you know, what the consumer wants. I mean, that's, you know, it's a consumer focused business, you know, first and foremost. And so, um, you know, while I wouldn't call wine and spirits the enemy, um, I think brewers can learn a lot from the things that they're doing well. And, and many breweries do this great, you know, barrel aged stuff, um, you know, beer wine hybrids. Um, you know, there's lots of things that brewers are doing to take some of those cues from wine and spirits, you know, take some of their mom momentum and, you know, judo it and add it to beer's momentum. Um, sure. So, um, you know, I think it's something that brewers should be aware of, but, um, anytime you're focused more on someone else than what, what you're doing yourself, then you're probably missing the point. Now I saw somebody put forth the, the complete opposite idea that actually craft beer has more in common with craft spirits than it does with big beer. Do you, does that sound accurate to you? Because I mean, I could see that being said, but I can also see some merit to maybe that not being accurate. Uh, they're probably overlapping Venn diagrams. I mean, certainly, you know, uh, craft shares a lot with just all beer in terms of, you know, some of the occasions it fits in, you know, how it's distributed and sold, um, you know, how people, you know, progress in their, their beer drinking journey. Um, but I could certainly see that the comparisons with craft spirits, the the ties to local, the focus on, you know, the, the, the process of, you know, small scale manufacturing, you know, thinking about ingredients in a different way. Um, so, you know, I mean, the smart brewers are going to understand their place in the beer industry, but they're also going to look out and they're going to take cues from, you know, what craft distillers are doing and, and winemakers are doing and understand that today's drinker doesn't just drink one. They drink all three, and the more you can get them to drink a little bit more of your products when they're you know mixing between those three, the more successful you're going to be. What are you seeing from some of these alternative beverages? And I've seen more and more people comment on this. Becky, I think I saw one of your friends comment the other day when you posted a beer, and they said, have you tried the hard seltzers? 
and we're seeing many more people mention that. It seems like those are coming up. Uh, what are you seeing on those? They're certainly growing a lot in the numbers, um, you know, and, and they do appear a little bit more sustainable than some of the, you know, uh, flavored malt beverage fads that we've seen where, you know, they often have that boom splat cycle. You know, we saw this with the hard sodas where they were everywhere for a couple of months. And then, you know, next thing you know, they're they're not selling at all. So I, I think they're they're appealing to a different consumer base maybe than just the, that FMB world. You know, we'll see. It's, it's certainly, you know, hopefully is drawing some consumers into beer. I worry that they're also leaking some consumers out of beer, that people who would be drinking beer are drinking those. And then, you know, it's one step to a vodka soda. Um, But, um, you know, I mean, for for a lot of beer companies right now, you know, times are tough and um, anything you can do to to sell, you know, use your capacity, sell a little bit more product is important. So, um, you know, I think we're going to see a lot of brewers. We did a survey of our members recently and asked them, you know, what products are you making kind of outside of beer? And a lot of them are interested in in kind of broadening their beverage portfolio because that's where the drinker's going. Increasingly, you know, drinkers want to drink all sorts of things. And, you know, you guys are on a beer podcast, but I, I'm sure you've had a few beverages that are non-beer in the, in the past couple of months. Sure. Um, Sure. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, that's how everyone We've had some today. beer guests too. Yeah. That's so true. We, yeah. we dabble. So yeah. you did mention that survey, and I was going to ask you about the. In addition to just beer, what what did you find? People were actually making. What are there trends for brewers making additional things beyond beer? Um, you know, I, I won't go too deep into the numbers because um, we haven't fully shared them with members yet. But you know, I think it's safe to say that that you know the Brewers Association members, who are a broad swath of the breweries in the country, are interested in products that they think their consumers are interested in. So you know. They're thinking about hard seltzers. They're thinking about you know FMBs and hard sodas. They're thinking about you know wine and spirits in states where you can you can cold those licenses. And you know we've seen this. I mean we see many brewers who are, are doing a great job and, and growing in different markets. You know Dogfish Head has you know a spirits line that, that's pretty successful for them. You know some brewers are actually starting to then you know mingle the products and you know barrel aging beers and the spirits that they make and vice versa. Um, so. I think we're going to see brewers, you know, take that creative spirit that they brought to brew in and um, increasingly take it to a whole set of products as they diversify what they do. So speaking of things beyond beer, what about states with legal cannabis? I've read a lot of stories where brewers are expressing their concern that making marijuana legal is going to reduce beer sales, is going to hurt their, you know, market share. Uh, We've certainly seen that statement on the SEC filings from some of the large brewers. I'm not sure I've seen too many small brewers as concerned about it. You know, what we see in the data is that it doesn't have too much of an effect at all. Um, that's not to say that it won't in the long run. Um, you know, it's possible that in the long run we will see them as substitutes and, and people will, you know, stop drinking beverage alcohol and, and move into cannabis. But so far, that's not what the data shows. Right now, if you look at it actually and you break states into three groups, states where it's illegal, states where it's recreationally legal and states where it's medicinally legal, the states where it's recreationally legal have the best beer trends and the states where it's illegal have the worst beer trends. So it's pretty hard to build an argument about how, you know, cannabis is is pulling for beer sales when you have those numbers. And, you know, generally, I don't think that, that people have thought through cannabis in the right ways, that they think about it directly on beer sales, but that the real challenges are going to be how do you measure intoxication in the tap room? Um, does it compete for growing land with uh, with hops? Um, you know, there's lots of, you know, we're seeing in, in here in Colorado, one of the challenges brewers have now is getting warehouse space because there's so many, you know, grow operations in, in and around Denver. Um, so the challenges for brewers may be real, but they won't necessarily be customers moving to cannabis and away from beer. It's interesting when you dive into that, you think on the surface, you wouldn't think about stuff like warehouse space. Yeah, you really wouldn't, but issue. they're going to need the same resources. It's it's sure. a related plant to hops, so it's going to have the same growing areas too, you would think. Well, Bart, we want to talk to you some about the, the independent seal and kind of the campaign there. Uh, we know that in June 2017, the Brewers Association launched the independent craft brewer seal that brewers could adopt and use on their packaging and other marketing to announce that they were independent. Uh, why is this something that's important? Well, we think it's important, A, because it's important to the consumer. Uh, a majority of craft consumers tell us they factor small and independent to their purchase decision. Um, and then B, because they don't really know. Um, you know, it's not everyone's job like me. To, to keep track of who's independent and who's not. Um, you know, probably not as many people listen to your podcast as they should, so they don't get news like, you know, the, the CBA acquisition. And so that means for, you know, average person who's just looking at a supermarket shelf, wants to factor that into the, to their purchase, uh, but doesn't know who is who, a seal is a really easy way to help them do that. And, you know, at the end of the day, we're, we're trying to help our members be successful businesses, and we think this will help in the marketplace. It's not going to be for everyone. We're not going to pretend that, you know, suddenly, you know, everyone's going to buy something with the seal on it, but we think it'll help them, you know, our members who put it on their packaging, win those jump balls, 
individuals. And when somebody says, I want to support somebody who's small, independent, local, um, that when I see that seal, I have confidence knowing that, that they have been certified as a small and independent brewer. I'm going to pick that choice today and take it home and, and drink it. Is that something, Bart, that you are seeing that the average consumer is taking note of as well, rather than just the craft beer consumer or the, the serious craft beer consumer? Uh, you know, I think it's going to take time, and, and certainly we're expecting some of those serious craft beer consumers to have conversations with their friends and family. Um, you know, one of the other findings that, that led us to do this is knowing that craft beer shoppers and craft beer consumers aren't always the same, um, that people who are buying the beer, you know, you often have friends buy beer for you. I know my mom now, um, you know, she doesn't know a ton about the industry, but I can tell her, you know, mom, if you're going to the store and you're buying beer when I'm there for the holidays, just make sure the seal's on it. You don't have to know anything about the industry. Just look for that seal. Um, so the hope is that the people who are passionate, care about this, will translate that information to other people um, and we'll see it spread in the marketplace. Yeah, spread knowledge. Bart, we thank you for your time today. We always, uh, a show like this goes by too fast. And it really does. go by a lot quicker than you can realize it is. But that about wraps it up for this episode of the Beer Guys Radio Show. Uh, Bart, thank you again for joining us and sharing information on craft beer statistics with us. Thanks for having me. It was a lot of fun. Absolutely. If you enjoy the show, please do subscribe to Beer Guys Radio on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Overcast, or your favorite podcasting app. And please do make sure to leave us a review. Thanks again for tuning in. Have a great week. And don't forget to drink local. Cheers. The Beer Guys Radio Show on the Beer Guys Radio Network. BeerGuysRadio.com. 